Matthew here from the Mini Wargaming Forge, and here in this video, I want to talk to you about FDM printing. FDM printing, of course, being the one where the plastic is laid out in layers, and it's great for terrain making. Now, if you're wondering, should you do FDM or resin printing? I've got another video for that. You can check that out in the description, or maybe I'll have a link somewhere on here if I really get to all of that. So we're just talking about FDM printing here, how to get started, what printer to choose, and what tools you're gonna need in order to print awesome looking terrain. So come on over here, let's take a look. We've got a couple FDM printers, of course, that we use. We've already talked about this in the other video. We got the Prusa Mark III's, and they're great. Um, right out of the box, if you pay the extra money, to have them assembled, which I highly recommend if you can afford it because they take like eight hours to assemble and then they do all the configuration for you as well. Then they print right out of the box and they're awesome. Of course, the powerhouse that I will always recommend are the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbons because they move two to three times as fast and print way better and don't leave as many lines along the side. In fact, it's almost as soon as you put paint on, you can't even see the lines at all. So we have both of those running right now. Now, if you're just looking to get into the hobby and you want to learn all the ins and outs of a printer and you don't want to spend a lot of money yet, or you don't want to risk like breaking a really good printer, then down here, which I'm no longer using anymore, we have our Creelty Ender 3s. Now in the video of the FDM versus resin, I did talk about all my recommendations. I just still want to quickly run over each of them with you. So the Ender 3 is a cheap printer and it has cheap parts, which means you're going to learn how to replace everything from the hot end, to the fans, to even this tube. I, I've had four of these and two of them right out of the box, I had to replace this tube because the one that was in it would melt too easily from the heat, <laughs> which you think that they would put a tube in that would be good enough for that. And then you're also gonna wanna replace the screws eventually and you wanna, it, there's just all sorts of stuff you wanna do with this. But the, the huge advantage of using the Ender 3 is that you get to learn every little part of the printer. So we don't use these anymore because we need to produce a lot of stuff. So if something breaks down every once in a while for a hobbyist, it breaks down even more often for us. And we used to have four of these and I was repairing all four of them every week because we're running them nonstop. So we went to the Prusa Mark III's and eventually the Bamboo X1C's. So the pros of course of an FDM printer is that uh, they're relatively, the printer itself isn't relatively cheap, but what you're printing is. So you can see that everything is printed from this PLA which is just a type of plastic, which is totally safe. You don't have to have an enclosure or ventilation. There are other materials you can print with, but we're not gonna worry about them for the purposes of making terrain, which is what the Mini Wargaming Forge is all about. It's about terrain and miniature. It's not about all that other stuff, at least not yet. And so we don't have to worry about ventilation. We don't have to worry about an enclosure. So if we come on in, let's take a look at how a FDM printer works. The concept is really simple. Obviously the application of it is where the engineers have to do all the work. So we start up here. We have a roll of PLA. These usually come in one kilogram or 2.2 pounds. And they're not usually too expensive. 20 to $30 American is what you're typically looking at depending on what you want. You can even get them in multicolor, and so they transition so you don't have to paint them afterwards if you're doing fun stuff. But I just like the gray the most because of the way it looks when it comes out. So what happens is one way or another, the PLA is pulled down into our hot end. So inside of this thing, there's a bunch of stuff going on in here. There is a heater, which melts the plastic, but there's also a heat sink, which stops that heat from coming up and melting the plastic too much. So there's a fan on the side, there's a fan on the bottom, each with their own purpose. On top of that, we have obviously the X, Y, and Z axis. What that means is this thing goes back and forth on a belt. The plate itself or the build plate goes back and forth on its own belt and then the entire extruder will go up and down on these screws and with that control it's able to go in the x y and z axis and be able to get all the control that you need and carefully lay out that plastic as you can see it doing right now the build plate itself is heated you can see I'm not sure if these numbers will show up on camera but we got 60 degrees for the build plate and right now we're melting the PLA to about 210 degrees. You don't have to remember all of that because most of the slicer's pre-built settings, once you tell it what kind of PLA you have, will know exactly what temperatures it's supposed to go to. But 210 degrees for the nozzle, 60 degrees for the build plate. The reason the build plate is kept warm is so that the plastic on the bottom layer stays a little malleable and sticks to the build plate. And once, because once it cools, it just pops off really easily. What's really cool about most of these printers as well is that the build plates come right off and they're flexible, which means if you have a big part, you can bend it to help it pop off in case it really sticks on. 
You do want to keep these clean though. Like right now I'm touching it with my hand. That's not a good thing. I'm getting all the oils that come naturally with your hand. Doesn't matter if you can normally feel them, you will get them on here and that'll stop the plastic from adhering, which is, we're going to talk about how you're going to maintain that pretty soon. But that's how a 3D printer really works. Even when we go to the more expensive bamboo labs, they're doing the same thing, just maybe in a different way. They have the bed going up and down. As you can see with this one right here, I'll turn on the light for a second so we can see it really well. So the bed itself is what goes up and down. And then this one, the extruder goes in the X, Y position. So it has its benefits to do that, which we don't have to worry about in this video. That's just how this one works. And some other printers work this, well, this way as well, where the extruder goes in the X, Y, and the bed goes in the Z direction. And the nice thing about these two is they have a little webcam in them. So they actually record the video or the, the thing being printed as a time lapse, which is really handy. Now, the next step in the process, or I should say the first step in the process is to slice your file. And what that means is we take our three-dimensional file and it slices it up so it knows how to print each layer. So right here, I've got the bamboo slicer, which is for the bamboo X1 carbons. Uh, what slicer you use will depend on the printer you use. Uh, Prusa has its own slicer, for example. And so I don't mind using that one. There are some generic ones out there as well that other people recommend, but I find these work just fine. So here, I'm just going to bring in a file. In this case, I'm gonna grab, we're gonna grab a ruins from printable scenery's swamp. Kickstarter that they just did. That by the time you watch this video will be over, but there should be late pledges, so I'll put a link in the description below in case you want to get some. So you can see that I can look at this, this file in 3D, and I could do some modifications to it, but thankfully, and here, here's probably the biggest piece of advice I can give you for the entire thing. Know who to buy your files from. So they're called STL files, like an EXE or whatever. STL is the extension. And if you buy it from the right places, it'll make your life so much easier. When I was first buying them, I was buying them from anywhere. That looked cool. That piece of terrain looks cool. But then they weren't really optimized for printing. What I mean by that is the person who did it didn't really know what they were doing. They knew how to make a cool looking thing, but they didn't know how to make it so that would print really well. And so you'd have to add a lot of supports and supports with FDM printing are really, really annoying. So Printable Scenery does a really good job of making it so the majority of the stuff they put out does not need supports. For example, when we look at this tree, all the branches are pointing up, so they don't need supports. And then what you can do afterwards is you heat them up with a heat gun and then you can mold them to whichever direction you want. So in the slicer, there's a few settings you have to care about. Most of the defaults are gonna be all you want. So there's a couple things you're gonna have to think about. One is your infill density. So what the infill is, is if you had a solid piece of, let's say you're printing just a cube, well, you don't want that to be solid all the way in. And maybe you do, but not for terrain. And so what, what they do is you tell it what infill you want. In other words, what percentage do you want the inside to be filled with plastic? And typically things will recommend 20 or 25%. But for terrain, I found I've been able to get away with 10% infill. And by having a 10% infill, you save tons of time and a lot of PLA. Now, there's been very, very few situations where I've had to think of it otherwise. So 10% is gonna get you there 99% of the time. So here's an example of a print that we had to stop because of an issue that we were having, but hey, your benefit, you get to see what infill looks like. So that is, I think you have this one set to 15% infill, is that right? So yeah, this one's 15%. So 10% would use even less. So you can see how much empty space there is in there that is not PLA. Now, if you come a little closer, you can see that you still have to set things like the thickness of the walls. All the defaults that you typically get in slicers has always worked for me. But there might come some situations with very specific pieces of terrain where you have to modify yeah, that because things aren't strong enough or whatever happens to be. But I'm telling you, most of the time, if you know who to buy the files from, all the defaults will be fine. Now, the other thing you might want to think about is what's called a brim. So in the bamboo slicer, we can choose no brim, auto brim, or outer brim is usually what you're looking at. And what that will do, you know, actually let's go over and take a look at something that has a brim on it right now. So I put brims on these, not for the big pieces, but because of the smaller pieces. So what you see here, I'll just peel something off. That's a brim. So what happens is some files like this, which are very, there's a very small amount of contact space with the plate they have a hard time printing. Some printers will be able to print them just fine without any, any, any supports or any brims whatsoever. What happens is it gets higher, there's an increased chance that it knocks it off the build plate. And so this is why you want a very clean build plate is what, that's what we'll talk about. But by adding a brim, you can see that it adds support and it makes the bottom layers much wider. And it uses hardly any PLA and as you can see, 
comes right off. You might have to maybe use a knife or something to get some extra, but no problem right there. And it allows us to print these thin, tall pieces that otherwise, if I didn't have brims, I'd have to print in resin to be able to get those details. But you can see how this peels right off. Let's talk about the tools you're gonna need. Now, thankfully, every printer I've purchased have come with the majority of tools that you need. So, if we come over here, one of the tools, of course, is a scraper, a metal scraper, and that helps us to get the prints off. Be careful not to gouge your plate too much. Um, of course, clippers. I have so many of these because every printer I've ever bought comes with a pair. So those are very useful for clipping the PLA and everything else that you would need. Um, sometimes people recommend for extra adhesion that you can use glue. So if you're having a hard time with a specific part, you can take glue and you can actually put it on the plate. I have found that I don't ever really have to do that, but I have it here just in case. The other thing that you're gonna get tons of as you buy more and more 3D printers are Allen keys. So I'm gonna, just in case in different countries they're called something different, I'm not sure. That's an Allen key. If your country calls it something different, put that in the comments for me, because I'm curious. So most of the parts, as you're pulling it apart, will require an Allen key now. I think that's actually a screw, but you just use the Allen keys to be able to pull things apart as you need it. Those are the major things that you're going to need for this, but I recommend a couple extra things when doing FDM printing. So the first is IPA, alcohol. So I put mine inside of a spray bottle because this makes it so much easier. So you want like really, really strong alcohol. This We're talking 99.9% .9 IPA, not rubbing alcohol. Although you could use that, it's just not gonna be as effective. So you can just go online and buy that. And then I like to put it in a spray bottle because when I go to clean, I'll show you how. Oh, and lots and lots of paper towel. You're always gonna need more paper towel. So you don't have to clean after every print, but I just find that it's, because I use a spray bottle, it uses so little alcohol that all I do is to take a little bit of paper towel and I just spritz some alcohol on there and I give it a good wipe. Now, every once in a while, what you're actually gonna wanna do is take this build plate and wash it with soap and water, like dish soap. But honestly, I've been printing with these for months and I haven't had to do that. It's more of the bamboo ones that I usually have to clean a little more often. But other than that, alcohol will do the job. If you don't wanna use alcohol at all, you can use dish soap every single time. Just make sure you rinse it really well because any residual soap is gonna stop things from adhering properly. Let's take a look at all the other crap that I have on this uh, the shelf here. Now, some of it's for resin printing, so we'll talk about that in our next video. So obviously, you're gonna want lots and lots of PLA. Now, you're probably thinking, what PLA should I buy? Because when I go online, there's all sorts of kinds. It doesn't matter. Honestly, generic PLA from whatever company you get is fine. I don't ever need to think about this, but just in case you come across weird stuff, there's your specifications. You want it 1.75 diameter, and you want it to be able to do those temperatures, I guess. But honestly, every PLA I've ever bought, I hadn't had to think about that, and it works just fine. It's even fun to buy PLAs that change color in case you, and this one's actually uh, glow in the dark. And even that one, I just stick in there and I don't even change the settings and it works perfectly fine. So you can buy PLA from pretty much anywhere. Other stuff that you might need, I like uh, air in a can, what do you call that? Condensed air, duster, whatever it is that you wanna call it. It's good for just spraying out, cause you're gonna get little bits. If you just look at the floor for a second, we haven't vacuumed in about a week. You get stuff everywhere, little pieces of plastic everywhere. So yeah, we need to vacuum. But this will just help to kind of spray it off and get things. And that way also, if there's a little piece of plastic on the build plate when something's printing, you can just shoot it off without having to touch it and get your grease on there. So that's all you really need for that. Um, and of course, if you're a little more sensitive to the alcohol because of how strong it is, I do recommend using gloves. I know I just cleaned there without gloves, but that was just because it was a quick clean. But if you're gonna do a more extensive cleaning, then you want nitro gloves, not latex, because latex gets eaten up by resin and alcohol whereas nitro will prove to be much more uh, resilient to that. Where you want to get your STLs, that you always want to get it from reputable companies because not because they're gonna screw you over, but because they tend to know how to properly optimize these files. That's a huge thing that you want to do. I've, I've printed so many bad things. So a couple places I'd recommend, and I'll put links in the description below. The first one is My Mini Factory. Come on in, you can take a look. My Mini Factory is awesome, myminifactory.com. There's also Thingiverse which has tons of stuff, not just miniatures and terrain, whereas my mini factory tends to focus more on miniatures and terrain. Uh, one of my favorites, of course, if you're looking for fantasy terrain, is printable scenery. So printable scenery does all sorts of different fantasy terrain, a little bit of post-apocalyptic and sci-fi as well. And I'll put links to other 
recommended places that you can buy. And some of them will be affiliate links, so I might be a little biased there, but I do, I have printed these and have experience with them and know that they do work out pretty well. Well, I hope you enjoyed that crash course in FDM printing. There's a lot to cover, of course, but I think that'll get you started. I'll put links in the description below to my recommendations, all of the different products that you wanna get. I'll try to make that as extensive as possible, but I know you're gonna have more questions, so please leave those in the comments below and they'll help me decide what to cover in future videos as well. So this is Matthew from the Mini Wargaming Forge. Happy 3D printing.